Jack Culper, who's named from Berkeley. And just so I just want to announce, Peter Hotez um, is here uh, at 3 o'clock uh, giving a talk and then having a conversation in Global Health at 4 o'clock. And that's in the Allway 106 building. So there's quite a lot of activities today for some reason. We have a concatenation of stars um, that are visiting uh, Stanford. So my introduction to Jack is uh, Jack is a triple um, degree person. He has an MD, an MPH, and a PhD. Um, his MD is from Hopkins, and his M MPH and PhD is from Berkeley. Uh, he did his training at UCSF, but uh, then he came here um, to do his chief residency. So he's actually a chief resident at Stanford. Um, and then went back and did his IV training um, at UCSF. Um, he now uh, is a professor of epidemiology at UC Berkeley, where he teaches um, methods and designs of large field trials. Um, he has done at least four um, triple-blinded um, randomized studies of um, water, sanitation, uh, and hygiene, and how it affects child, child health um, in Bolivia, but has also worked in at least five or six other countries. He's worked for the WHO and the World Bank, um, giving them expert advice on how water quality can actually be um, improved. Um, today, I actually uh, looked at his CV and was amazed that he's in the midst of now randomizing 22,000 children in Bolivia, in Bangladesh, um, to a water sanitation um, intervention to see if it affects their health outcomes. So he's going to share with us today some of the challenges of uh, doing field studies um, in um, these large populations. So thank you Jack, great. very much for Great. Well, it's coming. great to be back. And um, I spent many hours you know, on. I don't know how you came back as chief resident. Okay, sure. <laughs> I spent many hours sitting where you're sitting, listening to various speakers and wondering if I wanted to be a lab jockey or. Um, someone doing procedures all the time or what and kind of stumbled into this career that I have which is sort of a mix of infectious disease. I still practice at the VA in San Francisco in the ID clinic or uh, teaching. I teach quite a lot. I teach intensively in the fall each year and then uh, not the rest of the year when I do the rest of my traveling and teaching and writing. And then I do a lot of field, uh, field trials of different uh, public health interventions. So if you have interest in international health or infectious diseases or these kinds of things, global health, uh, that's uh, something I'm happy to talk with you outside of, uh, outside of today's lecture about. So I'll, I'd like to describe, um, to create a framework today, I'll, I'll sort of make a Christmas tree on which we'll hang some ornaments about different issues that come up in study designs. But I want you to think more broadly. I mean, if you're not passionate about diarrhea like I am, which is sort of a key outcome I work with, then you have some other outcome that you'd like to measure rigorously. So the designs we're going to talk about today are trans transportable to many other both field and hospital type questions. So um, I think you'll see as we go what I mean. And feel free to interrupt me because I'll, I'll stop and ask questions. So let me articulate some of these challenges first in my next slide. And then I'll illustrate these with a study that we did in Bolivia. And we'll go through a bit talk about some of the design and analysis challenges caused by working with big populations. And then time permitting, I can talk a little bit about some of our group's current work in, in, these, uh, in these other countries. All right, so let me, these are just, this slide is just to remind me to bring up a couple of issues that should permeate the whole talk. One is uh, on one of my trips to Bolivia, going out to see one of the farmers who was a, whose family was a participant in the trial I'm about to tell you about who wanted to show me a new latrine that his family had. An NGO, a non-governmental organization, had come through and built thousands of latrines in this section outside Cochabamba where we were working. So, you know, as is often the case, an NGO can put up on its website, built our latrines, health is better, and so forth. So we're walking out to the latrine, the farmer opens the door, and it's filled with potatoes from the bottom of the pit to the top of the roof. So it was never going to be used as the way you might think a latrine was going to be used, but it was a great place to store potatoes. But nonetheless, the NGO can come through and build its latrines and leave its mark, and people can do what they do. I've had other similar experiences coming on, on the heels of CDC interventions done a, a year or two before I arrived to do my work, where drinking water storage containers that were built for sta safe storage of water now serve as the soccer goalposts for the, the village. So, we do lots of things in public health, and we assume that 
kind of the process outcome of having done them and checking them off is enough. And in fact, what, what I and a number of other people, actually a lot of economists are really getting into, are things called impact evaluations, where we really try to see, have these big programs made any measurable difference with respect to health? Now, of course, measuring meaningful outcomes, diarrhea, child growth, cognitive development children, is much more difficult than counting latrines. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about the, the issues that arise from whether or not people participate in your studies because compliance, as you'll see in the study I'll present, is a really important and big issue. You should challenge me, as you should any speaker, on the ethics of what we've done in this trial. Was it ethical to do the trial we did it? What do you think about our comparison group? Was that uh, in violation of a number of guidelines you've probably studied about uh, performing studies in the developing world or not? What's it like to work with multiple disciplines? Uh, this, this work involved engineers, anthropologists, economists, behavioral scientists, and uh, you can just imagine what that's, I mean, you know what it's like to work with surgeons and radiologists, and right? So this whole mix of people with different disciplines creates its own kind of microculture. Another uh, generic topic that applies to any sort of work that, involve cluster, that involves cluster design. So in the work I'm gonna describe today, we're gonna talk about randomizing villages. You might be randomizing wards, or you might, in large-scale studies, be randomizing hospitals. And when you use a design such as this, it creates methodologic issues about contamination and spillover. Nothing to do with water contamination, but a spillover of the effect of your intervention and its effect on potential outcomes in the different units that represent the clusters that you're studying. It creates sorts of difficult issues for sample size estimation, sampling, um, and analysis. What happens when you go on your happy way in your dissertation or your project and you uh, carry out a big intervention and then the government comes along with some other co-intervention that you have nothing to do with but it totally addresses the outcome you're interested in and sort of swamps the area. You know, you're doing a water sanitation intervention and some other organization comes along and builds its latrines right in the same village. How do you, how do you take care of that? Lots of behavioral science lurking in what we're doing today. You may or may not have interest in that. Uh, we can certainly talk about it. The study I'm going to describe today was not a blinded study, so that should raise some methodologic issues for you. I do do blinded studies as well. Those are more difficult. We can talk about what one might do to uh, obviate the need for intensive blinding in a, in a cluster randomized trial such as, such as this. Another uh, theme I'd like to leave you with today or have you think about is that when you do studies such as this, that the people who are measuring the outcomes of the study are different, should be different, from the people who are delivering the intervention. There's just a natural human bias built in. If I tell a, pro a health promoter to go and promote solar water disinfection, as we did, there's a natural bias if that person is recording the data to want to think that the people who got the solar water disinfection treatment are better. So they're going to shade, unintentionally usually, but shade their recording of the data in ways that may influence the truth about what you're trying to find. So separating the implementers from the promoters is an important theme. And then uh, the need for hard outcomes. So although the study I'm going to talk about today was powered and measured on diarrhea, uh, we should talk about other outcomes that are possible in this sort of field and in others. All right, so let's talk about a specific trial to illustrate some of these points. So the technique or technology I'm going to talk about is called solar water disinfection or SOTUS. And it's almost uh, achieved status as a religion. So people in the field of water and sanitation believe deeply in solar water disinfection because as you're going to see, how could this not be a good thing? It's so sensible, sustainable, all those other S's, uh, sexy, you know, it, it just works. It has to work. And it does work. In the laboratory, if you treat water with enough sunlight in clear bottles, it will eliminate most of the pathogens. Now, not all. Can you think of a particular pathogen that's a waterborne pathogen that might be difficult to eliminate? It's really difficult to eliminate in municipal systems, too. Cryptosporidium is tough. So cousin of Giardia, really tough uh, cyst, et cetera. So it's not great for cryptosporidium, which is something we deal with enough, but it's not the the key issue. So it, it does leave a few holes in the coverage, but, but it's free and it's widely available. And the technique is to expose bottles of water to sunlight for a day. I'll show a little bit more about that in a minute. And then the family usually has two sets of bottles. They put one up on the roof one day and then bring it down and drink it and then the next day the other bottle goes up. And it's not just the, the, uh, the radiation itself, the UV radiation that's treating the water, it's also the heat. So at higher temperatures, it requires less radiation, so this synergy goes on between the two 
treatment modalities. All right, so here's a study you've probably seen, I think, from BMJ uh, about um, whether we need to do randomized studies to study everything. So a lot of people in our field have the, the view that, you know, we know that good drinking water is a good thing. Why do a randomized trial? That's kind of a silly thing to go out and spend, in this case, $3 million doing. So this study was called Parachute Use to Prevent Death and Major Trauma Related to Gravitational Challenge, and it's a systematic review. You're all familiar with systematic reviews. And the expensive conclusion reached was that parachutes reduce the risk of injury after gravitational challenge, but their effectiveness has not been proved with randomized control trials. <laughs> So lots of things in life aren't going to be subjected to randomized control trials. We're not going to take residents post-call and assign half of them to go driving in a dangerous situation and half not, and then see whether or not there's more traffic accidents, right? There's just certain things that must be common sense. But the issue here, looking in the solar water disinfection issue, is whether or not people actually use water treatments the way they're supposed to use them, and that results in better health or not. So Things can work well in the lab. We all know this from drug trials and everything else. And then you take them out into a population and not so much. OK, uh, one common problem in international development is this um, thing I alluded to earlier about this mismatch between implementation outcomes. Some people call these process outcomes. The economists call these first stage outcomes. That in some causal sequence, one has an idea about the different steps that should happen in the intermediate steps of a process. So if I treat solar, uh, if I provide solar treatment to water, I should see an improvement in water, and then I should see downstream from that the improvement in health. We're coping with a big World Bank study at the moment where we got some amazing improvements in health in a big uh, campaign in seven million people in six different countries. Big improvements in health, but we couldn't show any improvement in the intermediate steps of the water getting better. And then as we look more deeply into the data, we saw that many outcomes other than diarrhea got better for things that shouldn't have improved with a water intervention, like bruising and uh, um, uh, abrasions and things. Anybody know what those alternate outcomes are called? You ought to think about these in studies you do or read. So you have your main outcome in a study, but you're also interested in other outcomes that might have nothing to do with the intervention. And if those got better in your intervention group, you have a problem. So what's that, uh, what are those other outcomes called? Important term to know. Those are called falsification outcomes. Have you heard that term? Uh, some people call that negative control outcomes and so forth. But falsification outcomes is a term I think is most descriptive. So um, again, uh, not just in uh, the issue of diarrhea, but you know, if you're studying malaria, I work with a lot of people who spend their careers counting bed nets. But uh, the measurement of malaria is really where it's at. But again, it's much more expensive, harder. People who work on HIV infection count condoms distributed. But we really <coughs> want to see changes in HIV rates. All right, here's the SOTUS process. Uh, um, so clean bottles, which are widely available anywhere in the world, and I know there's a pointer here. Uh, bottles are cleaned out, filled with water, put up on the roof. Where we worked at in Bolivia, um, we often had people with a, kind of tin corrugated roof, roof. So if you have a reflective surface behind the water, all the better. It works faster. It'll work without, the, without that as well. Water goes up for four to six hours, again, depending on how warm it is. And then it's, it's ready for consumption. Uh, just to mention that a common and very effective way to treat water in much of the developing world is through boiling. <laughs> boiling is extremely effective, and it also gets our friend cryptosporidium. So it's really quite a powerful, effective technique. In urban settings, I work with uh, colleagues in Dhaka, they show me lots of gas lines out in the, the, the slum areas of the town where people, uh, you know, um, pirate gas supplies in order to boil their water. So they, th this is widely known. But out in rural areas, there's, not often, there's often not enough wood or fuel to supply the fuel to boil the water, so it's not such an easy thing to always do, even though it's very effective. But we also have this plague of soft drink bottles around the world, so these soft drink bottles we're all very familiar with can be used for the sodas treatment. So uh, the thinking, of course, is why not harness, harness these? This is from that uh, church of sodas that I mentioned, this foundation that works worldwide to promote uh, solar water disinfection. And these are just some different kill curves to show what, what degree of either heat and or sunlight and uh, radiation and heat combined are necessary to capture some of the, some of the more important organisms we care about in um, contaminated drinking water. <clears throat>
And here, just a reflection of this issue about sy synergy, that at higher temperatures, things uh, kill off. Oops, sorry. Things kill off quickly. I'll make the point that it's very expensive to measure all the, in there are so many, all the individual pathogens we care about in drinking water. So the field has pretty much resorted to using indicator organisms. And then, of course, like any field, there's debates about the best indicator organisms, whether you use fecal coliforms or total coliforms or E. coli. Um, all of them have advantages and disadvantages. Some of the disadvantages, for example, total coliforms, lots of animals shed coliforms. So you're, not, you're never certain if it's animal waste contamination. Not doesn't sound too tasty to drink either, but um, it's really human waste contamination that causes the main problem for uh, humans developing illness from drinking water. So again, the promotional campaign, uh, what, could be, what could be wrong? When we started this study eight or nine years ago, um, when we first put in the first proposal, um, the, uh, the, the program had spread, spread throughout the world. Many countries were doing it. Based on the results of a couple of small studies, one in particular in Africa among the Maasai that had shown um, about a third reduction in GI illness in tribal members who use the um, sodas, sodas technique. So the elders were taught how to teach their people the sodas technique. They went out and taught the technique. Diarrhea went down in young children under five by about 33%. And several facts I just mentioned there are going to be relevant as we come to some sample size and other issues. I think I've hit on most of the technology advantages of sodas so far. So let me skip over to the, I'll just make one other one though, is that the, um, the big push in much of the water and sanitation field is towards providing people with individual control of household level drinking water treatment. Because uh, you're familiar with the joint, uh, with uh, the Millennium Development Goals, for example. You've heard these, that by 2015, all these great things were going to happen. One of them that was that in uh, the drinking water field, that there would be a 50% reduction in the number of people receiving unimproved water in the world. And even that statement has a lot of problem because what counts for the joint monitoring program at the UN that follows water, what counts as improved water is uh, delivery through pipes. So you can deliver sewage water through pipes and that would count towards those MDG goals. So obviously a little silly, back to this issue of what are we really measuring, what do we really care about is causing an improvement. Some other limitations of SOTUS, it doesn't treat chemical problems with the water. I work in a lot of areas, for example, in India and Bangladesh where arsenic is a problem, other areas where fluoride is a problem. So this does not do anything for that. In those settings, sometimes people combine SOTUS with a physical filter, filtration type thing. This isn't useful for treating large volumes of water. It's meant for household level treatment. It uh, requires relatively clear water because the sunlight needs to penetrate the the column of water and get to the organisms. And if it's very turbid, the organisms either never feel the sunlight or they cling to the solutes that are in the water and uh, escape, escape treatment, essentially. All right, so here's the study I'd like to motivate our discussion with. This was an NIH-funded uh, project we did in, um, in Bolivia in children under the age of five. Um, obviously, choosing one's target population is critical. Obvious question, why would one want to work with children under five in a study such as this? I mean, diarrhea is a problem for lots of people. Yeah, so mortality is higher. Now, one, one important point is it's really hard, even in large studies, even in my largest studies, it's hard to use mortality as a primary outcome because the study has to be so big to power it properly. So in addition to mortality being higher, incidence is quite high in children under five. And that's why, you know, you always go look for an outcome with a really high incidence, regardless of what the, the uh, study is you're doing. We picked rural over um, urban Bolivia just because we didn't want to create this kind of stratified sense of if we saw different results in rural versus urban, um, we wouldn't know what, what uh, that meant. This is an issue for everybody doing urban studies in urban populations around the world. There's intense migration. So it's really hard to do urban studies and know in a long study that you're going to have the same population after you've enrolled them, you know, a year or two years later and so forth. We had uh, 22 communities with 660 children. They were randomized equally to SOTUS versus current practice. Who's going to challenge me on the ethics? Current practices, they're going to keep doing what they're doing. You should have a problem with that. Is that an ethical thing to do? 
you've heard of the HIV trials where pregnant mothers were treated and another group was randomized to current care, which was no treatment. Those trials were stopped, created a huge ethical debate. I hope you've been engaged in at some point. Anybody see an ethical problem? With I'm okay with ethical problems. I, this is my, my life here. So what's wrong with this study? Everybody's a, I can tell when I'm talking to clinical audiences. Yes, in the back. Uh, so that's a, that's a great side question. After we did the study, another study was published, unrelated to ours, dealing with the polypropylene uh, phthalate that is the coating of the bottles. And it does leach, in fact. And in you know, lab rats exposed to 10,000 times a human dose for a year, you can get a, a mesothelioma kind of thing. But that wasn't an issue for us at the point. But that's a good question. Is the treatment itself a risk? Let's assume we're cleared of that, because that, that, that was nowhere in the literature when we started. Yeah, now that's a, that's a great methodologic problem. So current practices could vary in the different clusters. Fortunately, in this study, they didn't. We weren't too concerned about that. But certainly, you do worry when people are just doing whatever, as opposed to giving them, you know, we're not giving them a placebo to take. So the, the ethical challenge that we would often face here, anybody? Yes? That's right. So we have these people doing current practice, which is to consume their water. Literally, I'm, I don't make this up. I mean, they go outside their their uh, um, dwelling and they reach into the ditch and they take water out and then take it back and feed it to their children. Hard to believe that that's a safe practice, but that is current practice. That's what they do. So can you think of a way, um, how, then how could you do a controlled study if, if, if we agree that that's an unsafe practice? And if we agree that investigators shouldn't be promoting or encouraging or enrolling people engaging in unsafe practices, what's the out here? So here's the way we did this dance. And I, I, I feel OK about it, but it's certainly open for discussion and challenge. The NGO we were working with, Project Concern International, was not able to do all the villages they wanted to do in the year we were going to uh, do the study. So they could do about 10 to 15 villages a year. What we did decide to do, and I think this has uh, application to lots of programs in the developing world, we asked them to introduce randomization into the villages they were going to enroll in their first two years. So they were going to take essentially 10 villages one year and 10 villages the next year and ramp up this program. We asked them to do that rather than the way that it's normally done, which is, you know, my cousin is the alcalde of this district or whatever. We go first. To do it with randomization. And in fact, we found that people actually preferred to get a government, to get, not a government, to get an NGO program through randomization process. And we had a big public randomization process. We had bingo balls where we had the communities paired into treatment and control, and it was randomly drawn who was going to be treatment and who was going to be control. So we found that people actually preferred randomization to just assignment in the way it was typically done was these kind of programs would usually come through. The reason I say I think this has broader ap applicability is in a lot of work we do with other organizations that are rolling out big campaigns, there's the potential to introduce randomization into what they're doing with just a little bit of thought and scientific uh, uh, presence. So what, a large part of what my group does now is try to convince NGOs that are rolling things out that, hey, you could introduce randomization in this, cover the same number of people, and yet then have a study that has some scientific inference from which you can draw perhaps some valid conclusions. OK, another technique, methodologic technique we used here that's widely applicable to any kind of work you might do on the ward if you're doing individual studies or cluster studies is we pair matched the uh, villages on baseline diarrhea. So pair matching is a kind of a whole separate side village or side thought. Let's step over to that thought for a moment. Why might one want to cluster match, uh, pair match clusters or pair match the units of randomization in a, even in a trial, in a clinical trial? What's the advantage, disadvantage of pair matching? What's randomization supposed to achieve on its own? Decrease in bias of what? What causes bias when you don't randomize? Sorry? Confounders? Yeah. So here's an extreme example. You know, I do a study of uh, some drug for prostate cancer. And I get a group of 1,000 men in their 30s and 1,000 men in their 60s. And I give both. I give one group, uh, the 30-year-olds I give the drug to and uh, just prevent prostate cancer. The 60-year-olds I don't. And then I report, well, there was no difference in, you know, didn't work, whatever. But what's, what's unbalanced there, of course, is the age. So if I didn't have randomization to equalize the age and all other factors that I care to be 
importantly different between the groups, then I've created a group that really can't be compared to the other. So randomization is really critical. In studies that are going to be doomed, if there's an imbalance in an important variable, it's critical to try to balance those variables of a baseline even beyond randomization. And pair matching is one way to do that. So if you know your, your key outcome by, you know, if I flip a coin a thousand times, no one's going to be surprised if I get 400 heads and 600 tails. But that might be too imbalanced. Even though it's random, that might be too imbalanced to do the study I want to do. So I add something extra to ensure this balance beyond randomization. And that one way to do that is with pair matching. We matched on baseline diarrhea. Could you think of other things one might match on in a study such as this, solar water treatment for reducing diarrhea? Or why match on diarrhea? Obviously, we thought that was an important enough uh, covariate to match on. What other variables might be of interest here? Oh, so, okay, so you could match on environmental factors, right? You could match on uh, differences in uh, the village structure, differences in temperature, whatever. However, we knew that diarrhea was one of the things that most strongly predicted future diarrhea. So by matching on diarrhea, it's an attempt to make the baseline conditions, which is what you want in the trial, make the baseline conditions as equal as possible. We uh, chose a sample size that I showed you earlier to detect with 80% power. A reduction of 33% in diarrhea between the groups. So if the, you know, the rate of diarrhea in the, the uh, groups before any intervention is 10 cases per child per year, we'd be able to see something at 6.7 or lower per year, 33% reduction. Now, why 33% reduction? Where, did, where do you think that comes from? How do, you, how do you make sample size estimations in studies before you start? Prior study. So I had told you earlier that the prior study in the Maasai in Kenya showed a 33% reduction. Remember that? So turns out that's about the, the largest reduction, smallest reduction we could afford to power the study for, too, for our budget. You know, the NIH has a fixed budget for a study such as this. So you have to find an out, you know, you have to shoehorn your outcome and your sample size and your effect size all together in this magical mix that makes your study fundable. So if if we couldn't afford to do a 33% reduction, we might have had to pick a different outcome with a larger reduction. What do you think? Is it harder or easier to do a study to detect a larger effect? So if we had wanted to detect a 50% reduction, would that have required more participants or fewer? Fewer. It's easier to see large differences, right? If I'm looking, if I wanted to declare a heavy person different than a light person, <coughs> the greater the discrepancy between the two, the easier it is to pick that up. If they're you know, 16 ounces different, I can't pick that up easily. And it's the same thing in these large studies. The larger the difference you're looking for in effect size, the easier it is to power the study to see the, see the difference. Okay. So we enrolled the 920 children. On average, there were about 37 children in each of our village units. And that's another important point. We randomly sampled the children to be in the study in each village. We couldn't afford to enroll all the children. So the clusters create this sampling frame. Uh, in which we sample randomly the children to participate in each, uh, in each thing. I mentioned that we pair matched people on baseline diarrhea. That baseline diarrhea was gotten from an eight-week study before the study started to measure what diarrhea was in each of the villages. And our process created very good, you know, kind of table one uh, balance of, uh, of um, covariates of the villages. You'd like to see in a randomized trial that all the things you can think to measure have roughly lined up because you're hoping that all the things you didn't think to measure also are balanced in a randomized trial. So we worked, worked in an area called Totora right outside Cochabamba, right smack dab in the middle of the cocaine trail. Um, that, that whole industry was a big part of the, the area in which we, we were working, so that created all sorts of other uh, secondary, uh, secondary issues in, in conducting the study. I talked about spillover and contamination. Earlier, I can tell you kind of from my personal journey through the different villages that these are quite far apart, quite isolated. We had really no concerns about common markets or common sharing of, um, of uh, water supplies and so forth. So we weren't too worried about contamination and spillover. Here's this pair matching process at the beginning. These are the community cluster numbers. And so, for instance, these two communities are paired because their baseline diarrhea is the closest, so on and so forth. And then in a random public process, 
two balls are in the bingo jar for these guys, and whoever gets picked first becomes the intervention group. So it's random who becomes the intervention group in each pair. So the randomization is done at the pair level. Lots of different things are collected during the course of the study. One important point I'll make is that while SOTUS, as it's being rolled out worldwide now, is basically, and back to the parachute idea, uh, SOTUS is parachuted into these villages in most parts of the world. People are trained once or you know, you know, a weekend workshop kind of thing and then left, left alone. We didn't do that. We were trying to conduct an efficacy trial here as opposed to an effectiveness trial. So we had our promoters going every two weeks to the villages throughout the course of the year. That term efficacy, effectiveness, a common parlance for you? What, what's the difference? How is this efficacy, not effectiveness? Or it's a spectrum, you know, efficacy. What, anybody, what's eff efficacy? It's the potential of something to work. Yeah, under, under highly controlled conditions, efficacy is like in the lab. If I control all the conditions and it works, I've shown that something's efficacious. Whereas if I take it out into the real world and sort of stilted, I mean, sorry, in non-stilted or in, in real conditions, we call that effectiveness, but there's a spectrum between it. So you could argue our study, SOTUS in the lab, that was kind of an efficacy study, but not of health. Our study was, we think, the best you can do for promotion of SOTUS in the wild, so we view it as an efficacy study. So here are the key results from the study, sim simplified down. So diarrhea incidents, let me first tell you what these outcome measures mean. Diarrhea incidents refers to the number of episodes of diarrhea per child per year, and the way WHO defines diarrhea is three loose stools in a 24-hour period. And the way we define episode, which is uh, common in the literature, is an episode is a new occurrence of diarrhea that's more than three days separate from the original occurrence. So that you know, if you have nine days of diarrhea in a row, our presumption is that's the same pathogen. We're not treating that as a different episode. So episodes are separated by three days of no symptoms. As opposed to prevalence, or in this case, a term would be longitudinal prevalence, where we're measuring the number of days a child is ill in the year divided by the number of days they were observed. So as expected, you would see more, um, uh, the, the number, the absolute number of longitudinal prevalence would be higher, because you're going to have, as you count up days, there's going to be more days than episodes because of that business of needing to be separated by disease-free days. This is a plot of the longitudinal prevalence over time in the study. And um, I'll make a point that in, in many human health population studies, you see this dramatic fall in incidence of disease early in the study in both the control and intervention groups. Uh, lots is being written about that now. Our group is working on some of this methodologic uh, underpinning of this. But it's kind of a, we think it's kind of a type of Hawthorne effect. So let's look at the results and interpret those together. So in terms of episodes of disease, the control group went from 4.3 to 3.6. And that ratio of those is a 0.81 with this confidence interval. Anybody want to interpret that? Give up on SOTUS, continue SOTUS, promote it globally. Sorry? But it seems like no effect. OK, no, and you say no effect because? The because the confidence interval crosses the null, which is? Oh. Right, OK, so let's work this through. So if the confidence interval crosses the null, we say that we don't have evidence at the level of evidence we'd like to see that the treatment worked. Now, we're talking about big stakes here, right? Global childhood diarrhea. What's our best, I mean, in our gut, what's our best estimate of the effect of SOTUS? Forget confidence intervals and p-values. If you had to pick a single number to represent its effect, its reduction or increase in diarrhea, what would you say it is? Yeah, 0.81. Now, clinically, would that be meaningful or not? If I could get a 19% reduction in childhood diarrhea in the world, do I have to argue with you that that's meaningful? That's huge. I mean, a 4% reduction in diarrhea would be huge in terms of life saved and, and uh, growth uh, promoted. So we're left with this bit of a dilemma that we went through this big study, came to a conclusion that's suggestive of an effect, but we can't prove it with the kind of uh, a level of uh, trial certainty that we'd like to have, say, for a new drug. But we're not talking about a new drug. So as you can perhaps imagine, what came, came about after our article was people who believed in SOTUS believed in it even more strongly. And they said, at Colford Group, what they did wrong in their study was what? Because if 0.81 were to be the true estimate, let's just 
in a different parallel universe, assume that our study got it right at 0.81. What would turn the confidence interval into a significant finding? More power. What would I need for more power? I'd need more people. Can, and you, you can't. But who can guess at how much larger the study and the budget would have had to have been if, .8, if we had powered the study for 0.81 instead of what we powered it for, remember, click, 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 back to the earlier slides, what did we power it for? 33% reduction. So that would have meant we needed to see a 0.67 here or lower. But let's say we went into the NIH and said, we're looking for a 0.81, 19, 20% reduction. What does that mean? How much larger would the study had to have been? It would have had to have been two and a half times larger. So now it's a $10 million study. So this is, this is tricky because if someone else is going to go out and replicate this now, they're going to need a study that much larger to do this. And let's just look at the consistency or not of the longitudinal prevalence measure. Also, uh, confidence interval crossing one, some reduction. So hard, hard to know for sure. Yes? Could you argue that um, in a sicker group, you would have been able to detect the difference better? Because looking yeah. at it's 4.3 in the control per child year. And 17 prevalence, you know, on one hand, you can argue that's not a lot. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very sophisticated set, uh, uh, question. And let me make a point. Do you remember what we thought the baseline prevalence was going to be? When we did our baseline calculations I talked about, what did we think diarrhea in the wild was? Anybody remember? It was about 6%. So this is a 30, this already, a, so if you want a 33% reduction, what you want to do is get my group to come and do a study because then diarrhea is going to go down by 33% before the study even starts. <laughs> and this happens all the time. In lots of human health studies, when you go out into a population to do a study, all of your assumptions and even pre-measurements often <coughs> change. Now, whether this is because the people who are in a study are different, like the kind of the Mr. Fit lore and this sort of thing, or just bad luck, we don't know. But this happens over and over. Yes, sir? It's such a simple intervention to check to see if your control group sort of looked at it and said that's that easy, a, that's, that's great. help us, let's do it. Yep, that's going to be on a list of what could have gone wrong here. That's great, and it's the next slide. Good question. Other questions about the results? What's this p-value of 0.19 mean? You, are you all sick of interpreting p-values, or the statisticians beat this into your heads already? Anybody? What's a p-value of 0.19 mean? How does that relate to that 0.81? Right? It has nothing to do with the 0.81. That's a complete coincidence. <laughs> it's, just lead you. it's often a good first-year epi question on a test. Um, but what's that p-value telling us? There's about a 20% chance that the null hypothesis is true, uh, given your data. Then you see this. Um, yeah, so I'd say a little differently. There's a 19% there's a chance that, that if we did this study over and over again, we could see a result this extreme. <laughs> Extremely different, but the null would still be true as you as you started off. That's uh, that's well said. Okay, um, let's go on and make some more points here. All right. So somebody asked about compliance and, and whether people were using it. And by compliance, there's an issue not just with the group that got the solar water treatment. There's also concern about whether the group that didn't get the solar water treatment started doing solar water treatment because they were watching people get solar water treatment. So. Um, Luckily, I don't have any of that up here about the control group, but we have it in the paper, and I know that number. So um, it turned out that about 1.3% of the households in the control groups were using SOTUS at points during the study, so quite, quite low. But now this all, these data all reflect the active group, the treatment group. So let's talk about human nature. So we measured SOTUS use in a couple of different ways. We went to the people right after they had gotten trained, you know, all excited, lots of community campaign energy. You're going to be in this new program. And a couple weeks into it, we asked them, are you using it? How's it going? You like SOTUS? So here's their response. About 78% of the people reported were using SOTUS. So that's a little disappointing, but uh, it's not 100, but it's there. And just jumping to the end of the study, the same amount reported at the end of the study. And this was a question framed as, did you use it in the last, I think, two weeks for using service? But sly investigators that we are, as we were in their houses, the promoters were trained to do a number of different things. They were trained to ask for a cup of water. And they watched where that cup of water came from. Often they declined that cup of water <laughs> when they saw where it came from, because often it didn't come from the sodas bottles. 
they also went and looked for sodas bottles and recorded where they were. So there were a number of kind of passive measurements about whether or not sodas was being used <coughs> compliance. Let's look at how that compliance compared to self-reported compliance. And I'll just make the point, I can guarantee you this, if you go to a lot of literature, more often than not, self-reported data are used. But if you don't leave the talk today fearful of self-reported data, then I have failed. Um, so here are the sodas bottles in the kitchen. That's down in the 10 to 20 percent range. So on average, over the whole study, over all the weeks of the study, it worked out that we had about a 31 percent compliance rate in terms of weeks that the bottle should have been in use versus weeks that the bottles were in use. So one third of what happened. So now the story gets even more complicated. So if this 19 percent reduction is true and it comes from such low compliance, is this a compliance phenomenon? So can you think methodologically or more analytically, how could I take the data that you know I have and look at whether or not compliance is related to effect? What's the effect? Reduction in diarrhea. So what am I going to correlate here? What two variables am I going to make an XY plot of? What could I do? Yeah, so I could comply, plot compliance and diarrhea. I could do that as a continuous measure. Or I could divide the groups, which is what we did to have enough to analyze. I could divide the groups into levels of compliance and then look within each group to see whether or not are the people, and this is very commonly done, are the people with really high compliance, was the reduction in diarrhea greater among that group than it was in the people with very low compliance? The slopes were the same. No difference in the groups in the relationship between SOTUS use and the outcome in the different groups based on compliance. Yeah. Yes? Was there um, a different number of bottles given to each household depending on how number many of children? Have that's children. right. That's right. So that was all calibrated based on the number of children in the house and so forth, right? Okay. So um, any other questions about compliance? Anybody give people drugs where compliance is an issue? Yeah. So just think about self-report. Think about compliance. These issues are very generic. Okay. Um, I lost track of the time there. So we have ten minutes, I think. So I, uh, I'm going to pause for a moment, just open it for any conversation about the Bolivia study, and then I'll, I'll talk about some other work we're doing and some of the other challenges that raises. Yes? Is there any variation in the seasonality of how clean oh, the water is? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. There is variation in the seasonality of the water in that when it, when it just like here in the Bay Area, maybe much to your surprise, when there are lots of rains, water quality can change because there's lots of flushing that occurs from sources on the ground that get into the water system. So yes, in, um, in uh, times of heavy rain, uh, there's a change in the water quality. Luckily, in our randomized trial, we had controls throughout all the, the various seasons. So that wasn't an issue for us here. Other, other questions about Bolivia, compliance, ethics? Yes? Um, you said that, uh, so were, these, were the builders enrolled encouraged to and the reason I ask is yeah. why, if it's so uh, cheap and easy, and all the villages knew about it because of the randomization, like the bingo, yeah. why didn't they just do it? Have you ever tried to give somebody cholesterol drugs or daily aspirin or anything? Well, I'm a pathology, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully, hopefully not. But it's too late when it gets to you, okay? Human nature is just tough in that lot, there are lots of things we know should be easy and should be doable. But ours is not the first. In fact, it's one in a line of 10,000 studies to show that people often don't do what they know to be potentially good for them. So the, the behavioral scientists on our team work on these issues about how do you promote it more. Now, what I will say is that our promotion of SOTUS that I alluded to with that earlier cartoon, our promotion of SOTUS was, you know, I'm going to say 10 times more than the way the SOTUS campaign is traditionally done, which is to drop off the bottles and leave. So. We could not humanly have done any more than every other week. I mean, the, I, well, you couldn't tell. I showed you how remote those communities were. So getting to those 22 communities in these little valleys and mountains, you know, this was not an easy task for the promoters to get out there. Um, so I don't think we could have done any more on that on that thought. But it was certainly something we had thought of. Other questions? Yeah, Michelle. Is hand washing at all? Ah, so hand washing was not part of this study. It's part of other studies we do. So with a variable like that, in a trial, you assume that there isn't an interaction between the intervention you give, like clean water, isn't changing people's washing of their hands. 
I mean, the, the causal path would go something like that, like this. What if they got clean water and now they're more attentive to these issues, so they also, also wash their hands? Well, if anything, you'd think you'd see an increase in the reduction, right? A, a larger reduction, a, more, a greater health benefit, which we didn't see. So either it didn't happen or it didn't matter. You wouldn't necessarily think that the people doing what they were currently doing would change their hand washing at all. So this is, we call this a conservative bias in the sense that um, we, are, we are likely underestimating the effect, which is what you tend to want to do when you're trying to prove something new, new works or doesn't. Yes? So does this type of work argue more for at least a village level type of intervention that, that like the one in Goldsboro, where they have pipes or some yeah. central sure. or something? Boy, this is tough. This is a big dilemma in our field because certainly, because of the human behavior issues, centralized, structured, uh, systematic, I should say, systematic interventions generally work better. And, you know, for instance, in the U.S., there's a, someone here on the Stanford campus, Grant Miller, who's tracked how typhoid plunged as sewer systems were built, public sewer systems were built across the U.S. You could just plot the steady fall in typhoid as sewers came online. And they didn't all come online at the same time, so you could see this nice sort of time series. So ideally, system interventions are better, but they're expensive, they're, they're, hard, they're hard to get to that last mile to the people out there. So that's why, for the past several years, this household level focus has been kind of where the action's been at. Because no one, there, there's really, I, I don't think there's little, there's much scientific debate about whether a pipe system can be better. But then you have places like Milwaukee, where they have a pipe system, and someone flips a switch the wrong way, and the system gets loaded with cryptosporidium, and you have 10,000 cases of cryptosporidium back in the early uh, part of this century. So. Um, it's a, it's a tough dilemma. So this, this is meant to give people who care to do something about it household level individual control. Other questions? Yes? Was there anything on health outcomes with COVID? I don't know if it's anything. Oh, and the other ones? Yeah. So just published recently a group from Ireland uh, that we've now written a, a letter of uh, discussion with them in the journal about, but they are claiming to show a, a reduction or an improvement in child growth in a group that got SOTUS in a completely another study that just finished. They did that though, it was a randomized trial, but they did it with modeled data and they don't show us what the actual results were. So this is always kind of for an epidemiologist makes us a little twitchy that if I can't see the raw results, I don't really know whether the model is doing something that the real data aren't and it's just kind of bizarre not to show your raw outcome. So that's a active debate our group is having in the literature now with this other team and that, that just came out. That's uh, Ronan Conroy. And, uh, and Dupree's is the first author. Other questions? Things we're going to measure in upcoming studies, I'll just say a little bit about. And then maybe, uh, well, let me, let me talk about a, another set of studies that I'm working on with. Um, so we use SOTUS? Would I use SOTUS? <clears throat> I think if I, if it, personally, if it were the only water treatment technology I had available to me in a situation, I would use SOTUS. Would I recommend it for promulgation around the world? I'd have to say, honestly, the evidence doesn't yet support that. Because these things come with a cost. Should SOTUS be done in preference to boiling? Should it be done in preference to other, you know, should it be done in preference to vaccine? If you're a health policy planner, people like to use these sorts of data, how do I, as a, a minister in the government, make a decision between my water people asking me to do something versus my vaccine people asking me to do something versus my nutrition people asking me to do something and so forth? So in other studies we're doing, we're combining water interventions with other health interventions as well to see whether there's synergistic effects. You know, there's a lot written in the HIV literature about, um, there's a fellow at, um, at UNC who works on this, who's on the NIH study section for HIV. Um, blank on his name, but big push about drinking water in HIV patients in Africa improving their response to antiretrovirals. So that, that sort of, I think that's the next generation of water and sanitation studies is how does water and sanitation relate to, um, relate to uh, other uh, synergies with other diseases and so forth. In our work in Kenya and Bangladesh that Michelle alluded to, we're actually doing uh, not just diarrhea, we're also doing child growth. Child growth is actually much harder to measure than you might like to think. Um, we, we like to call it a hard outcome, but measuring squirmy children <laughs> with these stadiometers you have to use to measure them is not an easy task. That's really difficult. So um, 
that's another outcome. We're also measuring cognitive development two and three years after the intervention. A uh, little side story, I have a colleague who's now a professor at Berkeley who has his dissertation work, wow, 20 years ago, did a cluster randomized deworming trial in Kenya. And they had the foresight to gather very good, this is before cell phones, to gather very good uh, follow-up uh, information on how to find these people. So now with the NIH's help, they've gone back and uh, interviewed, I don't know, like 85% of the people who were in that study. So all these people had that we know was different. They were randomized to a school program for deworming, you know, just mass albendazole, let's say, or whatever the, the uh, anti-parasite du jour is, versus the school clusters that got nothing. And now 20 years later, there's a striking difference in economic gain in the group that got treated. And they've tracked these people down to the UK and all the places people from Kenya have gone. So one of the tough things about these long-term outcomes that we all care about, like school attendance and so forth, and educational attainment, economic attainment, they're so hard to measure and they take so long to measure that people's careers have often moved along for the measure. I mean, even now, we're just getting Head Start data that's quite interesting, you know, from years ago when Head Start happened and the educational people are quite excited about, in some cases, some of the longer term findings for things that didn't work initially with Head Start but now look like they may have worked later and the only thing that was different in some of the children was the Head Start intervention. Other questions? I think that's enough time to do yeah. two more sites, so I'll stop there. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.